a prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence tonight one more time, and we are thankful that you have given us this ability to sit and listen to your word. Be with us and, and reveal to us and in us who you really are. And may it be that we will glorify you. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we've been looking at this uh, story <clears throat> of King Darius and uh, Daniel. And uh, last week we spoke about the fact that there is a law that king made and that law could not be changed and Daniel broke the law and as a result of Daniel breaking the law Darius now has a problem and his problem is how to save his friend on a law that could not be altered or changed and so we came to this point that the gospel is here where God shows us and reveals to us how he is saving sinners through this uh, story in the Old Testament. So Darius has a problem. He wants to save his friend. He cannot because the law that he has signed and decreed cannot be altered. And the conclusion we made, number one, was the law of God cannot be changed. The law of God cannot be changed. The law of God is eternal. It doesn't change because God's nature doesn't change. His word doesn't change, therefore. And we looked at many verses there last time. Then we come to the point that we saw the law of God is holy. And the law of God re is relating to his nature. As a result, something that is pure and holy will never change. The second thing we looked at and started to look at is a very, very important thing that almost no one talks about. And that is this, that when we say we have broken the law of God, we only look at the outward duties of the law as we looked at the 10 commandments. But then we learned from Romans seven fourteen that our law, the, the Bible says, for we know that the law is spiritual. That's a very, very important statement. What does it mean the law is spiritual? What is so spiritual about thou shall not steal, thou shall not commit adultery? Funny you ask, because we went to the New Testament and we looked at Jesus' interpretation of the law. I will give you one or two of them today, just to remind you. In Matthew 5, 27, we read Jesus saying, You have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Now, verse 28 is the interpretation of that verse by Jesus Christ. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already, in his heart. This was Jesus' interpretation of the law. You say, well, we should have blindfolds on then all the time. But then Galatians 4, you remember? Galatians 4 says, ye that desire to be under the law, ye that want to get into heaven by do's and don'ts, ye Pharisees, ye Jews that are, are, are passionate about keeping the law, then he says, Do, don't you hear the law? Don't you hear what the law says? Don't you hear it? My friend, the law is spiritual. The law deals with attitudes. The law doesn't just deal with an outward action. The law deals with attitude. The law deals with the heart. The law deals with a motive. The scripture says, the scripture says, if the outside of a cup is clean, if the outside of the cup is clean, what good is it if the inside of the cup is filthy? What good is it? And that is the question that we need to ask ourselves. If the outside looks good from outside, 
we obey the law. We, we, we act like a bunch of Christian people. From inside, we are filthy, filthy sinners. What good is it? So religion in general does that to you. Religion in general makes us look good from the outside. It makes us good from the outside, but it does not address the inside. That is why the scripture says that the law is spiritual. The law is spiritual. And so, when we come to the word of God, we need to understand that the law is not just deals with the outward duties, but it starts from inside of the heart. You know, the Bible says the, the mouth speaks from the abundance of where? The heart. You see, it is the heart that is the problem. It is internal. Now, as we looked at that, and I will come back to Matthew, maybe I will address Matthew 15. This is another example here of Matthew 15. This is very important. Matthew 15 and verse 14, I, or starting with verse 12, I want you to look at another interpretation of the law. The disciples came to him in verse 12 and said, Master, don't you know that Pharisees, that is the religious leaders, were offended after they heard all of these sayings. Don't you know? You're offending people. And Christ says, every plant, now look at this, every plant which my father or my heavenly father did not plant, okay, will be rooted up. That's very important. Leave them alone, he says. They are blind leaders of the blind. That is what they are. They are blind leaders of a bunch of blind people that follow them like sheep follow a shepherd. Leave them alone. Because if that plant is not planted by my heavenly father at the judgment day, it will be rooted up. And the disciples in verse 15 says, well, tell us, what do you mean by that parable? And in verse 16, Christ said, are you without understanding? Now listen. Don't you know that whatsoever enters the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the drought? So that's the biology of human being. These things, but those things in verse 18, which proceeds out of the mouth, come from the heart. They defile a man. Those things defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts. You know, if you were asked by someone to name the word sin, I heard someone say to me some time ago that he's committed the worst sin known to man. If somebody asked you to name the word sin, you know what would you name? Do you know what the Lord Jesus named first? Was the evil thoughts. It wasn't killing. It wasn't hitting. It was evil thoughts. When the Lord Jesus started talking about that which defiles a person, the first thing he said was evil thoughts. And then murder, and then adulteries, and then fornications, theft, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things that defile a man. You see, it starts with inside of us. To eat without saying a blessing, to eat without washing your hands, that does not defile you. We get, you know, we get our religion off of our sleeves into our hearts. It would do us a lot of good. Get our religion from outside to inside. It will do us a lot of good. It will do us a lot of good. And so therefore, the law is spiritual. It cannot be changed. Now, as we look to the next uh, slide, the third point, and the law therefore must stand because it cannot be, there cannot be changed. Turn back with me to Daniel, please. Daniel. And King Darius signed the law. He signed the decree. And these men said, it cannot be changed. 
his princess came. You remember the org chart? The king, the princess, the presidents, and then the princess, they came. It can't be changed, O oh king. And this is God's law, my friend. It cannot be changed. The law must stand. There is no loophole. I want you to listen. You don't need to turn there, but just listen for, for a minute on Romans 3.19. Romans 3.19. Now we know that what things whatsoever the law says, it say to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Do you hear what he's saying? That every mouth, well, except my preacher, no, including your preacher, no, every mouth, well, except that little girl that went to Sunday school, no, 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 including that little girl, every mouth, except my grandma Susie, no, including your grandma Susie, the Bible says that every mouth should be stopped. Daniel, you are guilty. And there is nothing I can do. King Darius labored, it says here in Daniel 6, he labored all night till going down of the sun and try to figure out a way to deliver his friend Daniel. But it could not be done. I can see the king in his chambers, back and forth. The law has been declared. The law has been signed and Daniel has broken the law and he paces up and down. How can I be true to the law? and yet deliver my friend Daniel. How can I be true to the law and yet set Daniel free? How can I do that? Turn with me to Romans chapter three, please. Romans three for a minute. Let me show you something in Romans three twenty six. If you can find the answer to this question that I just asked, you have learned the gospel. How can I be to the true, how can I be true to the law of God, but yet deliver you? If you can answer that question, you have the gospel. You've learned it. Or we can ask, how can God be true to his word, which is the law? and stand by it, and yet set you free. How is that possible? How is that possible? As you know, the Bible we read, the law cannot, it's the character of God. It is his word. It cannot change. So have you ever thought about this? How can God be true to the law and yet set you free? How is that possible? Those are two opposing forces. You have broken the law, and the law cannot be changed. The law is holy. The law is spiritual. And God says, every soul that sinneth, in Ezekiel 18, every soul that sinneth, it shall surely die. That is the law. The sentence must be carried away. And there is Daniel over there guilty. And there is Ramil over there guilty. He has broken the law. No question about it. And the law can't be changed. Here is the king trying to set him free. And he can't do it. One has to be sacrificed. Either Daniel or the law. If he sets Daniel free then the law is gone. And if the law is gone, then he is gone. His word is gone. He is no more holy. He is no more righteous. He is no more perfect. You see, if God sets me free, the law is gone. If the law is gone, the Bible is gone. If the Bible is gone, there is no truth in God, Jehovah. If he stands by the law, then Daniel has got to go into the den and has to die. There is two options. Now look at Romans 3.26. To declare, I say at this time, 
his righteousness, that God might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Let me read it in Assyrian. The of have a zadika, or have a makshatan of ile behemanut ad isha. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. How can God be just and yet justify me because I believed in Jesus? How can God be just and yet justify you? Justify means just as if you never sinned. How? How can God be righteous and hold up his law and exalt his law and honor his law and yet set me free against the law? Show mercy to me. How can this be done? That is Darius's dilemma, my friends. How can I do it? Darius said, how can I do it? You have broken God's law, my friend. Let me ask you, how do you propose to be delivered at the judgment? I've asked this of many people. How do you suppose you will be delivered? You have broken the law, not my law, God's law. You say, well, someone says, I think God loves everybody, so I'm not worried about it. I'm just going to show up there, and we're going to flip for it. Darius loved Daniel, but he couldn't set him free. Well, how are you going to be delivered then? How are you going to be delivered? It is not by the works of righteousness which we have done. That is in... Uh, um, it is not by the works of righteousness which we have done. The scripture says in Romans 3.20, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. In Romans 3.20, by the deeds of the law, no one will be justified. So, it is not by the works of righteousness, Titus 3, and it is not by the deeds of the law, Romans 3, 20. Daniel, I can't help you. You have broken the law. Now, Daniel, you only have one option. Your God has to deliver you. That's the only option you have. The God that you serve, the God that you pray to, the God that you worship, the God that you take your sacrifices to, your God has to deliver you. My hands are tied. Your God will have to deliver you, Daniel. Brothers and sisters, when Jonah got down in the bottom of the sea in the belly of the whale, the seaweed is all about his head. There was no Louis Vuitton bags there. There was no Donna Karen New York there around his head. It was sea leaves. And the iron bars were closed. He thought forever, he's dead. In the belly of the hell, he said, and he cried in Jonah 9, 2, 9. He said, salvation is of the Lord. You see what I'm saying to you? when you know that there is absolutely no other way, everything is closed. When you come down to the facing death eye to eye, Jonah prayed in Jonah 2.9, salvation belongs or is of the Lord. You and I have broken the holy law. You and I have broken the spiritual law. You and I are absolutely unable in any way to fulfill the law of God. We are shut up in the prison of condemnation. We are sure for hell as we are standing here unless somebody does something. And you can't do it 
and I can't do it, and the mother-in-law can't do it, and the sister-in-law can't do it, your papa cannot do it, the mother church can't do it, and the ordinances can't do it, and the sacraments for sure cannot do it, but only God can do it, only God. There is only one way to heaven. Jesus says, I am the way. Like Peter said, as he sank beneath the waves. You remember when Peter saw Jesus and uh, walked on water and he was so happy that he listened to his master and he stepped out of that boat and he started walking towards Jesus. But as soon as he took his eye off of Christ, he started sinking. And you know what he cried as he was sinking? And dying, he says, Lord, save me because I am perishing. You see, salvation is of the Lord. Daniel, Darius said, I can't help you. I can't help you. The law condemns you. The law just justly charges you. You have broken the law. You are guilty. You have got to go to the lion's den, there is nothing I can do. Nothing anybody can do, but God, your God. And salvation is in the hands of God, and mercy is in the hands of God, and grace is in the hands of God, and compassion is in the hands of God, and salvation is the gift of God, and he gives it, and he gives it freely. You don't need to give 10%. You don't even need to get 9%. I tell you, you don't even need to give two pennies. Salvation is the gift, free gift of God to you. Now, how did God deliver us then? How are we going to be delivered? Well, in Galatians 4.4, I want to take you there now. Here comes the good news. God doesn't deliver us by saying, well, let's just forget all these sins that you have done, okay? We're just going to write an amendment to the law like we do. Amendment number one, amendment number two. We're going to just amend the law. And we're going to forget about it because, you know, you're kind of a nice guy. You really helped the church a lot when you were on the earth. No, 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 no. He can't do that. Why? Because God is perfect, pure, holy. He cannot change. He can't say, hey, Apostle Peter, let, let this guy in, you know. Don't worry about it. He, he, he makes good food. We need some good food in heaven. No, 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 no. Can't do that. No, sir. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. In Galatians 4, verse 4. This is what we read. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law. Jesus Christ came down here to this earth. Now, God required that you obey his law perfectly, didn't he? He required that you and I obey, that we love our enemies, that we pray for them, which this, despite us and hate us, that we not ever have a thought or an attitude or a motive or an imagination of sin. But we couldn't handle that. We couldn't. You know what Jesus told that lawyer? What is the law? Well, love your father, God, from all your heart, mind, soul, strength, and love your enemy as yourself. He says, go do them and live. Go. But he can't. We can't do it perfectly. We can't do it perfectly. Maybe in front of each other, our standards are okay. But when we compare our standards to God's perfect, holy standard, we come short. We come short. Now turn to Romans 5, verse 19. Romans 5, 19. I've skipped some verses in Job. You can study them on your own. But Romans 5, 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Who was that? Who is that one man? Adam. 
Who is the second man? Who is the one that obeyed perfectly Jesus Christ? Back in the Garden of Eden, our father fell. And since then, every child that has been born has been born with a tendency to do evil. Not only was he imputed to us guilt, but he also imparted unto us an evil nature. And it says here, by the obedience of one and by the disobedience of one, we were made sinners. By the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. So Christ came down, Galatians 4, 4, as a man, and he met his law, and he obeyed it perfectly in every jot and every tittle, as a man, without sin. There the law says you have got to die. Christ came. He didn't have to die. He was perfect. Christ came, but then, and took my place. And he died for me. Now listen to that. The law says you have to suffer the punishment of your sins. Christ came and my sins were laid on him. And he suffered the punishment of sin for me. He took our place. He died and he rose again. He suffered in our stead. And that is how God will set you free. That is how God will set us free. He is just. At the same time, he is a justifier. He is just and he will judge sin. He is a justifier because he already judged sin. Therefore, he can justify you. He judged it already on Christ Jesus. Didn't he? And now you and I are set free. You and I faced death face to face, but Christ overcame. He ransomed me from the mouth of the lions. He ransomed me from the will of death and iniquity. He took me out. Oh yes, like that piece of wood that came out of the fireplace. It may be all whole, but it smells a little bit burny, right? It smells a little bit. It's like one of the jackets I had from high school. I never forget. I love that jacket. I love the jacket. Something burned somewhere and that jacket starts smelling like burnt wood all the time. Even though there's nothing wrong with it, but it smelled like burnt wood. You see, we have been imputed. We have been, we have been touched. We, our nature smells like sin. You see what I'm saying to you? The only way... Daniel could be set free as if God intervened. The only way Jonah could have said been free is when God intervened. The only way you and I could be set free is if God intervenes. I read a story, and I've said this maybe once in our church, but I'm going to read it in English now. There was a very old preacher by the name of Dr. Gordon, he was a pastor of a large church in the uh, East Coast many, many years ago. And he said that he was walking down the street one day, and one of his little Sunday school boys was coming down the street, and he had a bird cage in his hand, an old homemade bird cage, not like ours, gold plated with swings and water dripping and waterfalls and music. No, 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 no. It's homemade. In his hand, the old homemade bird cage in his hand. And in that bird cage were two little frightened sparrows, field birds. And Dr. Gordon said, as that boy walked up to him with that little old homemade bird cage, wired kind of together with hand, you know, he looked at that birdcage and looked at those little birds and they were just shaking and scared to death. And he said, son, where did you get these birds? 
He says, well, sir, I, I trapped them. Dolly Gordon says, well, do you want to sell them? Sell these old birds? Why, he said, these old birds are no good. Dr. Gordon said, I am aware of that, but he said, I will buy them. Well, he said, they can sing. Dr. Gordon said, I am aware of that, but I will buy them. He said, they are plenty more out there I can catch for you. Just like them, but better. He says, I am aware of that too, son, but I want to buy these. Why, he said, preacher, you can't go out there in the field and catch yourself some. He says, I know that, but I would like to have these two birds. And little boy says, well, I will tell you what I will do. He said, I will sell you these birds, cage and all, for $2. And $2 was a lot of money back then. Dr. Gordon reached out in his pocket and he pulled out $2 and handed it to the little boy. And the little boy shook his head <laughs> and handed them to Dr. Gordon with the cage for $2. He pocketed his money and he walked down the street. He said, the kid would turn around once in a while and look at me, just to make sure that uh, Dr. Gordon has not changed his mind and he wants to renegotiate the deal. Dr. Gordon says, I just stood there and held my birds and watched him walk off. And every once in a while, he would turn and look, you know, and kind of grin. And he said, I just stood there and waited on him. I held my birds. And he went on down the street. Just before he turned the corner, the little boy, take one more look again. And he shook his head and he just walked off. Cool preacher. What in the world he would want with these two, two wicked birds, old birds. And he rounded the corner and Dr. Gordon said, when he rounded that corner, I took my bird my birds and I held them up in the cage and then I took the wire off the door and I opened the door and I held it up in the air and I patted on the back of it and I said all right little birds I bought you you belong to me I am setting you free you can fly now you're free and he said those little birds spotted that open door and they kind of eased their way over there by the open door, you know, and glanced at him and hardly believed it. And then one of them took right off into the air. and Right behind him was the other one. And he said, as they went up in the air, he could almost read their thoughts. Set free, redeemed, I have been set free. One day, my friends, the law of God had me bound in the bondage, in prison, and I couldn't get free. You follow? The cage is not Satan. The cage is the law of God. You have broken. As a result, you are in the cage. Satan has, the, has, has, has made your life ugly. The law of God had me bound in the bondage, in prison, and I couldn't get free. And the Lord Jesus came and by, he came by and looked at me and loved me. And you know, he said to me, law, I will buy this bird, this old bird. And the law says, Lord, this guy is no good. He says, I know that, Lord, this guy is absolutely no good. In my flesh dwelleth no good thing. He says, Lord, they can't even sing. I know that. There are plenty more out there, Lord. I know that, but I want this one. But Lord, they will break your heart again. 
I know that. Lord, they will spit on your face. And they will revile you. And they will cast you out of church. They will humiliate you. They will deny you. They will reject you. They will say, crucify him. They will say, we want Barabbas. We don't want him. They will say, there is no king over us except the Roman Empire. We don't need no king. I know that. But I want them. How much will it cost law? And the law said, it will cost the silver of your sweat and the gold of your blood. And Christ says, I will take them. I will take them. And he came down here to this earth and he gave his life and he died for my soul and he bought me and he sent me the glorious good news of the gospel. And he said, fly out now, you are free. The debt is paid. I have redeemed you. You are mine and I will set you free. And brother, I have flown out, redeemed. You remember this hymn, redeemed how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the lamb, redeemed by his infinite mercy, redeemed his child forever I am. What the law could not do for us, my friend, God sending his son in the likeness of the flesh did for us because he was condemned for my sake, for your sake, and he has set you free. Do you believe that? Psalm 37, 39 says, but the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of what? Dancing, no. In the time of what? Rejoicing, no. Salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. You see, the way up, my friend, is down. The way up is down. You want to go up first, we got to go down. That means we got to be broken. We have to be humbled by the word of God. We got to realize how powerful sin is. We got to realize nobody can open that cage except God Almighty. The law has you bound in the chains. I remember Paul when he was in the prison, the chains on his hand. You know why chains fell off? Yeah, God is powerful. He can break anything. But more than that, God is telling us that the law cannot hold his people in jail. The law of God has no power over you because Christ has paid it. He paid it all. He paid it all. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, take the word and make it a sharp two-edged sword and pierce our hearts and reveal unto us the mercy of your great God. the love of grace and the compassion of our Lord to those bound by sin and bound by the iniquity and sentenced with the sentence of death upon us. Lord, reveal unto us the mercy of our great God. And yet, by his mercy, he has delivered. He has delivered and he has delivered and he will deliver. By his mercy, we know he shall deliver us. We are his now. He has owned us, bought us with his blood, and we shall never, never be perished. Lord, help us realize 
this truth. Help us understand the scriptures. Open our eyes so we can see you because we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.